Our final session of the year has arrived. We are about to begin. Um, I think it's too late on the pinball. If you haven't got your high score now, you're never going to get one. Um, the final session is about to begin. Uh, please take your seats as soon as you can. Uh, I am expecting to receive a piece of paper with uh, four names on it very soon um, uh, with the, the finalists. If we know who the finalists are, we probably don't yet, so you know what we do? We'll, put, we'll do this at the end. Um, because the four finalists of our charity pinball tournament uh, are going to be playing for the cup later on. So anyway, it looks like it's a very complicated mathematical exercise going on at the back. A lot of arguing. Looks like maybe a steward's inquiry. So we'll leave them to it uh, and we'll crack on because we have a suitably dynamic title for our last session, The Fast Track to a Sustainable DSP Future. Now, over the past day and a half, as you've you all know we've been discussing key areas that impact service providers and the vendor ecosystem and now we are trying to pull it all together and maybe take a little bit more of like a macro look at what it means to really be a DSP. What will customers, whether they're consumer customers or enterprise customers, what will they expect? And indeed also, very importantly, what will society expect? Society demands more from businesses. Now it demands more responsible businesses, you know, especially in areas of sustainability, the environmental impact, the workforce. It demands inclusivity and rightly so. Yet threats to our business are everywhere. We can't take this slowly. We have to move fast, and I've jotted this down. How much faster do you want it, said Neil about an hour ago. Um, that means identifying and then hopefully removing the obstacles to this DSP evolution. So we have a lot to talk about. But first of all, as you all know, we have a poll. So why don't we take a quick look at the questions we are asking you for the final poll of this year. We are asking what will stop CSPs from becoming successful DSPs. And we have seven choices there. Vote on whichever one you feel strongly on, or more than one, doesn't matter. Whichever, whichever factors there you think are important uh, and, are, and are obstacles, then please tick them and vote in the poll. Um, and also in the room, please, you know, you can vote, you can vote on your laptops, on your phones. Right, time to introduce, and in some cases, reintroduce our guests for this session. We've had a few last minute changes, unfortunately. Um, so I say unfortunate, I say fortunate because now we've got Diego. So that's, that is absolutely terrific news, you know. So um, there's, there's a bright lining. Uh, so from my far left, Jeff Hollingworth, who is the CMO of Rakuten Symphony, joins us. Next to Jeff is Ahmed Hafez, who is VP Network Convergence of Deutsche Telekom. So Ahmed earlier uh, on the first session of this show, and of course, Daryl Jordan-Smith, who is Senior Vice President, TME and Industries at Red Hat. Moving across to my right, Diego Lopez, gentlemanly, stands in for us, Senior Technology Expert at Telefonica. And next to Diego, on my far right, Anita Dola, who is the NGMN CEO and board member. Well, welcome, everyone. We've also got contributions from Yogesh Malek, who is... Um, He's uh, EVP, isn't he? EVP and CTIO at Tele2. And I spoke to your guest just a couple of days ago. He was unable to get here in person, but he has contributed some thoughts, and we will hear from those. But to start the session today, I would like to invite Anita to give us our final DSP address of the year. And Anita's going to focus on one key area here, the sustainability, the green area of our industry. Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so... Maybe to provide a bit of background, um, the Next Generation Mobile Networks Alliance is an operator-driven alliance. We exist since more than 15 years, um, and we have 25 operators representing the different geographical regions. And in our membership, we um, embrace the entire value chain. So we have software companies, vendors, consulting firms, research institutes, uh, more than 80 companies uh, right now in NGMN. And we actively work on uh, what I would consider is actually actively contributing to um, the way to a sustainable um, to, to the sustainable digital service providers. We work on topics like mastering the route to disaggregation with a focus on the end-to-end -end operating model, which perfectly fits into this topic on sustainability, so green future networks. We already work on 6G, which of course also has to do with um, how to become a sustainable uh, digital service provider. 
and we work um, also still in supporting um, the 5G full potential. So when it comes to environmental um, sustainability, so a very good practice actually for change management is that um, one need to provide evidence for the level of urgency. And I think it's common knowledge nowadays that actually um, we need to act very fast and we have an obligation as an industry, we have an obligation to support environmental uh, sustainability. Um, the uh, the uh, carbon emissions uh, need to be um, heavily reduced in the next years. Um, they need to be um, reduced by half uh, by 2030. We need to achieve uh, net carbon emission um, being zero by 2050. And that means that actually the peak has to be achieved in 2025. And the latest uh, reports actually, they provide evidence that we are already late, so it is questionable if we can achieve as a global community the tra trajectory to the 1.5 um, degree, which is um, the, uh, the, the, the target here. And um, therefore, um, we, we cannot, we must not lose time. But, um, and as if this is not enough, um, we have to expect that the global uh, mobile network data traffic uh, will increase by a factor of 4.4 .4, uh, between 21 and um, 2027. So uh, we have two, two, two parts here, two factors. One is that we need to secure um, the current uh, living standard with regards to environmental sustainability on the planet. And the other one is that we also need to cope with a heavy increase in, in traffic. Um, but the good news is that the industry is actually committed. According to GSMA lat latest climate action report, um, 50 operators already committed to heavily reduce their carbon emissions within the next decade, what is great. Um, this is actually um, standing for 45% uh, of the mobile uh, connections worldwide. And it is already 60% more than in the last year. So we are moving forward there. Um, so now when it comes to, um, so how, what are the biggest lever to achieve um, net carbon emission? Um, the big contributors to uh, carbon emissions in networks is of course the power consumption. Uh, but also diesel generators. So if we focus on network energy efficiency, if we focus on smart uh, batteries, um, if we focus on um, to increase the percentage of renewable um, uh, power sources, either by self-production or by purchasing uh, certificates of origin, uh, we, we can already achieve a lot. In addition, um, 5G pro uh, provides us already with very good tools. So if we lever the spectral efficiency of the 5G air interface and um, go ahead with um, uh, using advanced sleep modes, so switch off hardware um, at zero load, um, we can already uh, achieve um, significant savings. So the radio access network stands for approximately 70% uh, of the entire energy consumption of, of a mobile network. And um, statistics provide evidence that, um, let's say 20% of base stations uh, stand for 80% of the traffic. So of course there is a lot, there is huge potential to, um, to switch off um, hardware and resources when they are not used. Um, in addition, um, we need to focus on uh, new coo cooling mechanisms, um, um, liquid and free cooling, um, and um, to use artificial intelligence um, in a, a better dynamic steering and control of network uh, resources. Um, is this enough? No, it is not enough. So we cannot just focus on network energy efficiency. We also need to focus on the entire value chain. Um, Carbon emissions uh, from manufacturing are typically larger than carbon emissions produced from the usage. Um, and here it starts to be quite tricky actually because we need to look on the entire value chain um, upstream and downstream um, if we want to assess an end-to-end -end footprint of a service usage. This means that actually every 
participant in the value chain needs to report um, the carbon emissions. And it starts to be very tricky uh, to calculate and to come up with common methods of calculating uh, the service foot, the, the, the footprint of an end-to-end -end service. But it is not only already mandated by some uh, leg legislations and some markets to provide this information to our end users, um, it is also expected by our customers and end users that we provide this information. So this is, um, so I was asked to provide also an, an, an outlook on the main challenges. So this is a challenge actually, and it demands industry collaboration and cross-industry collaboration. We have a shortage of experts to come up with such methods and uh, such assessments there. Um, and it, it is important. Um, if you can't measure something, you cannot improve it, right? The other uh, topic here is um, how can we achieve a benchmarking um, of um, networks with regards to their um, sustainability? And um, we know that depending on the market, it is um, more easy or more difficult to have access to renewable um, energy sources. And um, if we want to benchmark networks and operators with regards to their greenness, um, we need to find methods how to make this a fair approach. You know, that's, that's another challenge. Um, so um, in addition, so net network energy efficiency, I mentioned end-to-end -end methodology of calculating the end-to-end -end service footprint, but we also have um, some low-hanging fruits there. So for instance, um, when it comes to lean packaging. So this uh, can also provide quite significant um, savings with regards to uh, waste and carbon emissions. Um, we need to improve refurbishment options for uh, equipment and product. We need to come up with completely new business models uh, by applying a life cycle assessments there. Um, so sharing instead of owning, for instance. And we need to improve the eco-design of products. So we use critical materials as an industry and quite some of equipments and products. Um, and um, we need to look into the entire value chain, as mentioned, from the depletion of scarce materials until the recycling. And here we have, as an industry, huge potential to improve. So all in all, uh, we need a true industry collaboration. Um, there are means which can be already implemented, and we know that operators are doing this by um, being focused on your own business. But to approach it from a wider perspective, we need to collaborate. Thank you. Thank so. you very much. Okay. You know, as an industry, you've been talking about many of those areas for, for, for a long time. There's been some movement, some traction. It, 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 I'm pleased to say it does feel now that we're, there's actually real momentum and we're actually taking this, this further. But I'd be curious what our other panelists have to say you know, and whether or not this whole issue of environmental sustainability might be baked into the DNA of, of, of the, your DSP, your Techco. Um, is this is going to be something that will be expected? It's not something we're going to add to. This is going to be here from, from day zero. Is it that important? Daryl. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is very important. Uh, and I think that we're learning all the time. It's not something that we've actually mapped out right now exactly what we're going to do. As, as Nita was saying, it was, we, we, we don't know what changes we're making now are going to have the desired impact that we're targeting for um, on the globe by 2050. In, in our business, what we also are finding is cross-industry collaboration is becoming very important. So we're working with Microsoft, Google, and uh, 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 Amazon in particular. And at COP26, we announced uh, uh, a formation of a database platform to collect information. It really started in financial services with risk analysis. So there was a business reason for them wanting to do the analysis in the models that they use to calculate risk associated with physical assets. Um, but we've been able to now expand that to other businesses like Airbus, for example, where they're looking at similar models and looking at different footprints and how they can use that data pool and the cloud to calculate their sustainable uh, footprint. So we're very active in, in doing that. That's sort of an industry-wide cross-tech, as you mentioned, initiative. 
In addition to that, we're very focused with a lot of our partners and, and our competitors working with our customers in Japan, for example, with IONE and OREC, which are initiatives with NTT uh, Docomo, NTT Group, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that whole ecosystem in Japan, including companies like NEC, looking at how we can actually, through software, minimize the power that you utilize in silicon that sits in some of the RAN environments in particular. Uh, looking at how we might take standards like ORAN and actually use those to reduce the power, power footprint. And again, trying to tie that into real business reasons why that makes sense. So I think there's a lot of things going on and we're learning all the time um, about how to drive that. So from a technology industry perspective, that's where we're very focused. And all of our customers are actually keen to participate. Thanks, Daryl. Any more thoughts, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think I'd like to, rather than having this as a standalone conversation, I'd really like to wrap this back into the total day and a half discussions that we've had here. That, uh, and I've been sat at the back of the room just trying to keep my head together, to be honest, with the diversity of some of the conversations. Uh, it, it sometimes, uh, it sometimes felt a little bit schizophrenic in this room, some of these conversations we've had. I'd like to just make the statement that a sustainable DSP is a business successful DSP. The most successfully sustainable companies will be the ones that are most successful because they can apply the right leadership, technology, and investment into doing that. Uh, and I've struggled over the last two days to understand really how telecom wants to drive that success as a, a digital service provider. Uh, on one hand, we celebrate ourselves because it's incredible what we have achieved. And, and I don't think the world could have survived the last two years unless that had happened. And if that's the goal of this industry, that's great. But then we have a separate conversation that says, uh, we haven't got the growth in the industry. We haven't got the relevance, the revenue coming in, what are the reasons and how do we cope with that? So those two things are almost, and the same people on one hand say the same things. Uh, but those two things, uh, I don't think we've resolved in our conversations yet. And then the, the other interesting part, and, and I think there's two people in the room, there has been two companies in the room that are demonstrably different. So I, I would describe Danielle, who <laughs> maybe isn't here because she had like her own party last night. I don't know, actually. The, uh, 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 she's a cloud software company. She's not a telecom company. Uh, I work for Rakuten, Rakuten Symphony. We're an internet software company. So the reason that we're here at all is because of a number of factors that I think we've touched on in this, in this session and, and I think we need to come back to. The first is that the government decided they wanted another carrier. So there is a regulation play inside this ecosystem that either locks or unlocks different things. Uh, but please understand that Rakuten Symphony, when they looked at taking that challenge on, they couldn't afford to do it the traditional way. They needed to do it a cheaper, faster, more efficient way. And, and what triggered me with what Dowell said is really how you do that when you're a software company is you move the center of gravity from a hardware supply chain to a software supply chain. And you gain efficiencies through doing that. Uh, four years of very hard work, very hard learning. Uh, we have seen the results. We didn't know what we were really getting into at the start. But what we have achieved, to come back to, I think, uh, the focus of this panel uh, from one perspective is extreme efficiency. Uh, now, I wake up in the morning, so the, the next bit that confuses me as an industry, and it's not people here, but it's the whole ecosystem, I saw an interpretation of that extreme efficiency as now Rakuten's causing unemployment in the world because we need less people. We're not causing unemployment in the world. We're trying to attract new talent into the industry that want to run it in a more sustainable way, a more software-based way. But sometimes I, I think, sometimes I feel as an industry, the whole of this journey is that it's almost, the industry is hoping Rakuten fails. 
in the hope that we don't have to do something different. And I, I just like to sit on stage and say, there is a different way to approach this business. And we're not here to just share our good learnings. We're here to share our good learnings and our bad learnings. And all of that has contributed to a, a total business sustainability uh, and also an energy sustainability that we think is quite good and we would like to share. Uh, now, my last comment, and then I'll, I'll stop, because Chris, I thought, was excellent this morning summarizing it yesterday. I thought his seven minutes was kind of just like Shakespearean. Uh, <laughs> The success of being a DSP, uh, fundamentally, is having product market fit. The job of every business is to find product market, market fit and the business model and then industrialize it. Uh, we in Japan, our product that we sell to answer Chris's question at the base level is just broadband, just broadband. Notice it's not mobile broadband. It's broadband. We start with mobile, but because of how we've built everything, we can ask, add fixed wireless access completely easily. We're doing that in a couple of uh, quarters. We're going to do broadband on that. <clears throat> and the opportunity then to serve our customers and actually give them really good connectivity, kind of where they'll pay more, uh, is, is a massive business opportunity. That's even before we get into loyalty points and ecosystem and everything else above it. So th this, this road, this route, this fast track to doing things differently, these alternative approaches, um, some will work, some won't work. Um, the, the, there's challenges, there's internal factors, there's external factors. We have had a, a, a good few questions in already from our online audience, so thank you very much for sending these in um, about this. So there's a few talking points I really would like to, us to uh, address because this is the last chance we have of doing this this year. Um, the first point is, is really looking at the critical internal factors in ensuring this transition, rapid, smooth transition from CSP to, to DSP in terms of technology choices and, and legacy integration. But there's also cultural aspects. We've touched on, on that earlier today. You know, what does that mean exactly? There's, 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 there's governance, the skills. Um, now, when we spoke to Yogesh Malik at Tele2, we, you know, we asked him about this and the, the skills the skills were certainly um, front of uh, his thinking, I think, as well. So can we, uh, can we have a listen to what uh, Yogesh had to say? I have to say mindset and culture would be the biggest because actually the digital world needs extremely good focus on interactions, which means experience becomes the brand. It is not a physical presence or advertisement, it's the experience. And I think that is the toughest challenge we as telcos are facing while we are becoming sustainable, while we are becoming extremely focused on energy consumption. I think this is the next level which we need to take. Okay, Yogesh there. Any, any thoughts at this stage from our room? Because I do like to... Um invite you all to, to contribute, you know, one last time. We've got about an hour left of, of DSP this year. So any, any thoughts from any of our guests in the room on, on, so far? Have your say now. Otherwise, we'll come back to you in a little while. Uh, you know, Diego, as your guest was saying there, mindset, culture, these are, these are internal factors. You, you, you know, you, you, we touched on this at the last session a bit as well. Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 the point is that even the, uh, since, again, since the blooming of the, uh, of the mobile networks and all the like, the whole industry is not only the, uh, the uh, uh, providers, it's as well our providers, our technology providers on the one hand, and the, even the customers and the authorities that are regulating, they, they got used to a quite stable uh, environment in which, well, things were as usual. You have one generation every 10 years, more or less, that it was at some disruption in, in RAM and architecture, etc. But all in all, it was 3GPP came with the architecture. We follow the architecture. The, the uh, vendors bring boxes according to the architecture. We deploy it. We mail our, our calls for procurement according to the architecture. 
And one of the curious things is that translated, among other things, in that the real differentiation among operators were more about price and basically marketing, whether, whether you were nicer or not to the, uh, to the customers, which is something that is really dangerous because that you enter, you enter in, a, in, a, in an environment in which everything is comfortable. Money comes, you business as usual, and you don't, uh, and, and this is something that is dangerous. And well, right now we are suffering precisely a, 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 a deep shake in all this, and we have to adapt. And I believe that in terms of people, people is, uh, is better prepared than we tend to think in that, uh, in that respect. But then is the organizations. And there are some, uh, well, very, very strong uh, uh, rigidness in the, in, the organi in the organizations that are natural against this change. And this is something that is, is, is going to be hard to break and probably will happen basically uh, because of a, of, a deep, uh, of a real need of change. And um, well, this is, this is the, the problem is that in some cases, this is, uh, I guess it's happening because maybe uh, some, uh, some, uh, mm, some operators have, uh, are suffering this ahead or before because they are in, um, in more uh, stringent markets or for whatever the reasons. Other maybe that can take some more time. Then you have uh, new players like Rakuten coming with a uh, with, uh, different way. We have the problem as well. It's not only the, uh, it's that. It's as you, you know, this uh, old joke about the only reason why God uh, made the universe in seven days, well, six, is because it has no previous installed days. And this is something that is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit like that. So, uh, and, and we have we had to run like this without breaking the, the whole thing because it's, uh, among other things, it's our obligation. And, and, but, but I believe that the, uh, the seats are there, and I think that uh, things are going to... Uh, I'm optimistic in that respect, because, uh, let me insist, my experience of the people I know in my company and elsewhere is that the people is eager, and in most cases, more prepared than the, uh, than the top management tend to think. Ooh. And we are, we are more... Uh, well, we, we need more... Uh, uh, a deep uh, um, organizational and structural change. Uh, yeah. Diego, that's great to hear. It's great to hear that you know, sometimes we think from the top down that there's, there's a, the, a lot of concerns, but you know, if, if the support's there at the, the lower level, that's, that's very, very encouraging to hear. Oh, um, I hope uh, so. <laughs> Ahmed, at, at Deutsche Telekom, you know, are there any specific internal factors that you're seeing that, that are impacting this transition to DSP? Right, I mean, um, actually, many good points besides your question, so not sure where to start. So just maybe, maybe because we, we just knocked on on, on, on skills and upskilling, uh, we, we believe that in the coming era, there will be a rise of interdisciplinary knowledge. So you need engineers that are aware of the network, very deep in the network, but they know cloud, or they know software development, or they know some, some other things related to the area. So it's... It's the softwareization of networks, definitely. And actually, this, this interdisciplinary knowledge is very important, which means that we are capitalizing already on the existing skills, because we have great skills in our industry over the years, but we need to augment that with the new aspects of the new era. But I also would like to, to make a couple of comments. Um, so, so actually, no one wants Rakuten to fail. So I don't know if this is true, but I think Rakuten inspired all of us into the direction that, that it took. But as you said, it's, it's product market fit. So if we look at the brownfield operators, where we already have assets, have customers, have running business, so would this transition help us at that time? How would it change our products and services? And here takes me to, to how we look into it in, in Deutsche Telekom. We look at the strategy of Telco as a platform, inspired by many things, including what Rakuten have done. So you, you've got three elements there. One is the value add for the customers. And this is critical because this is our business. This is the business market or product market fit and how you drive things because we need to be sustainable. But we look also on two other aspects and they are the foundation of that. So like the, this is the tip of the iceberg that will bring the money, but the iceberg is pretty big. And one of them is the autonomous networks. Auton and, and this means that we need to automate our networks a different level of automation, not just to make things that happen not manually so low, but it's, it's a complete radical shift into the way we approach automation, which actually would need us to, in, in some areas, to disaggregate 
and we'd need us to cloudify, and we need us to be data-driven, and this, this meant the things and integrate them via APIs, but not only via other means. So all these aspects are enabling the value, enabling to produce new services, enabling us to move faster, enabling us to be agile. On the other hand, the last one is the sustainable resilient ecosystem. So you see, I mean, the ecosystem discussion, how we work together, how we work on standards or de facto standards or work on alliances together, how we actually sustain our supply chain with all the problems that we're seeing around us. So I think these three angles are need, need all to work together in order to have a sustainable future. And of course, a big part of it is internal. I don't want to, to spend so much time talking about that, but at least give you the, the, the picture that we have. And, and we believe the three are pretty important. Great, great insights. Thanks so much, Ahmed, for, for, for going through those with us, because it does, it does lead into a question we've, uh, we've just received from our audience. And let me read out the question. How are CSPs poised to bridge the skills gap required to transform into DSPs? What are the different talent upgrades, talent sourcing, talent retention strategies that, that CSPs are taking? Well, there's a million dollar question there. Um, Maybe I could start just with, because I want to build on, on a, a, some themes that, that we've started here about skill set uh, and people. I believe there are some incredibly talented people inside telecom. Uh, I think the organization is designed to stop change. And that's the job of an organization. A startup finds a business model, an organization and company industrializes a business model. So change is inefficient, change is dangerous, change is risky. The whole process exists to stop that. Now, I, I, I feel very fortunate because I've lived my life in two worlds. I've, I've lived my life in a very traditional telecom vendor operator world. I know how that works really, really well. The last uh, six, seven, eight years, I've, I've lived in a very startup uh, kind of quote in telecom crazy people world. And it's very interesting to see the difference. And now I'm working for a couple of people that really do think that they've cracked the change code. Because you have to understand Rakuten, the reason Rakuten thinks they can do this better is because they've gone into banks and done banks better. They've gone in credit cards and credit cards better. They've gone into healthcare. It's not about the industry, it's about the mindset. It's exactly your point. People come to Mickey, who, you know, is the, and I probably shouldn't call these people crazy. <laughs> they, uh, uh, they say it's going to take us six months. He says, come back and do it in three. They always come back. You always come back and be able to do it in three. The pandemic showed what we can do when we have to do it. It's just that sometimes you don't, I don't think we believe we have to do it. I think we have a boiling frog problem where, you know, the temperature's slowly going up and we, the frogs actually jump out but we haven't, you know, in, in the traditional business. There's no metrics from a growth point of view that are good in this industry. That's why we can't get the talent coming in. Now, from an, a, a skill set point of view, we have two approaches that are quite interesting. One is that we want to build a career that people want to come into. That's a software, rule the universe through platforms, machine learning, AI, we went to the universities, we got those people we're, we're building. We're having discussions with different potential partners where we say, you go in your country and get a cohort out of the university, we'll bring them to Japan and we'll, we'll put them through boot camp for six months and send them back. It doesn't take an army, it takes, we only have 250 operational people running 270,000 cells. But, but Jeff, doesn't it take money? We had this discussion yesterday about what the hyperscalers are doing. You know, they're putting a lot of money into getting this talent. Well, so then if you get them out of university and start to bring them up in the right environment and develop them, the, the secret where, where my, I am a software guy that's in marketing, by the way, I completely agree with that comment. I never meet an internet person that isn't multidiscipline. It doesn't exist. So it doesn't take an army. It takes a group of people that are really good and really empowered and then have that right leadership. So the other way you augment, though, is through other innovative companies like Daniels and things. So when we work with small companies, we don't issue an RFP. We say, this is our business outcome we need. Now, we understand you have to make a business. What's the business outcome you need? 
And then if you can prove it can work, we can prove we can scale it. That works very well for the investors and for that company. It de-risks it. It's not risky for us at all uh, because we can actually take it through a process of proof in the real world rather than you know, a document that perhaps positions it in a different way. So there's, those, are, those are really exciting, interesting things to, to, to work with, actually. And, and there's no reason why telecom can't do that. Okay, Daryl? Well, I'm probably, I, I, I think I'm the list the second person that's actually on this stage actually visited Rakuten before uh, the pandemic. And uh, two things that strike me about Rakuten when you go and visit them in Japan, they're not a traditional Japanese company. You, know, you, you walk into the ground floor and you feel it's a software company. Yeah. It has a, a real live vibe to it. And the reason I'm saying that is because it attracts talent. People want to go work in that environment. They want to move, work in a fast moving, innovative environment where traditional, particularly in Japan, structural elements are somewhat removed. Um, you know, even when you go to a meeting room in Japan, you know, I've been in Rakuta's meeting rooms many times. And, you know, the, 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 you know Miki Tanisan, if a customer comes in, he leaves the room. He's the CEO of the company in Japan. That never happens. Yeah. Right. So culturally, they're, they're very, very focused on that. And I think it's acquiring the talent. And I've been I participated and again in a couple of things in Rakuten where we were doing sort of a, a chalk and talk session. And we didn't think anyone would come and show up. We had a full auditorium of 200 people show up just to listen to what we're doing in software with open source and why that might change the world and make it a better place. So the feeling, and that goes to Diego's point, people in these businesses really care. So if they care, they'll make a difference. We just got to help them and, as leaders with the right tools to enable, en enable a lot of that. Thanks, Daryl. Let me just one comment because <clears throat> I have very good friends working in hardware and they are smart people and they are really, I mean, we, we keep talking about, no, this is software and this is good and this is uh, the old ways. Uh, uh, precisely a, a holistic view of the whole business. I mean, taking into account hardware guys, software people, financial people, the marketing guys, everyone, I'm, I'm building, building multidisciplinary teams is precisely the, I believe is the right way to, to, to evolve. This is something that avoiding, uh, how to call it, that, you, you talk in English, ivory, ivory towers. You talk about this. Ivory towers. Ivory, ivory towers. Yeah. Avoiding these ivory towers in which you have the people from I am an architect, I am a security expert, I am dealing. At, I'm, 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 I don't know a service. Uh, is something that is uh, is a, is a highly desirable, and we try. And, and this is what what what, what they're trying to do right now when hiring people is precisely put into contact someone that is knows a lot of about optical uh, transmission with someone that is a data scientist with someone, and try to find what happens when you put them together and you make them work together. Th that is very important, and I would say that in general, not only for for DSPs in general, for the for the future of the economy, any company that wants to succeed would need to, to, to follow this. The, the hyper-specialization is good for certain aspects, but if you want to, to move forward, you have to mix and match uh, skills and, uh, and even attitudes. Uh, Anita, your organization represents a lot of telecoms operators. Is, is, is this a conversation you and your members have about talent? Going back to our online viewer and the, the question there about the need, the need to retain talent, the need to create new talent. I would say indirectly, yes, mm. because we work on this uh, topic, end-to-end um, -end operating model for disaggregated networks. And it is about um, a blueprint for operating models, uh, requirements to the industry, um, with a gap analysis with regards to what is already supported by the industry, but it's also about processes and uh, skills. Um, so, so indirectly, yes, but what, what I would like to add is a personal opinion with regards to uh, processes. Um, so I, I used to work for a vendor, for several network operators, for consulting firms, and this is not um, me now as the NGM and CEO, but with my personal background. Um, I, I, I support what was said before, that it is probably less about the individuals, individual people, because people want to develop typically, so we should not underestimate this. But we have processes in the companies, uh, legacy processes, which completely um, are 
uh, are stopping um, sometimes innovation. Um, and I give you a very specific example. Um, so if it comes to agile software development and um, um, a vendor um, deals with uh, pro pro procurement from, let's say, a big operator or any other big company, so it even does not necessarily be a, a mobile network operator. Um, typically, the procurement leaders, they are incentivized um, uh, with regards to saving opportunities. So they try to apply what we used to have with waterfall models that actually um, you get a penalty if you don't meet specific uh, milestones uh, with, with, with your delivery. But um, the agile software development has completely different principles. So if you, if you um, enforce those type of penalties to a vendor, um, the software engineers by default would not commit to the sprint results. So you shoot yourself in your own knee by applying those type of um, incentives. And I believe um, it, it has really to, to, to have a top-down approach to check everything with regards to processes, how people are incentivized, um, and to also put um, objectives and, and, or to use objectives which are um, encouraging innovation and also encouraging taking a risk. So it was said in, a, in the session this morning that actually we also need to learn or to, to embrace how to fail and to not punish people to, to, to fail, right? I mean, it's, it's a learning process. And um, so that's my personal observation. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for those, Anita. You know, we just covered you know, internal factors that are going to be impacting this transition from CSP to DSP. But I'd like to move on to look at some of the external factors and external pressures that are going to impact telco. So, you know, everything from supply chain, supply chains at the moment are, are, seem to be all over the place, geopolitics equally, uh, regulation, there's disruptive competition, you, you name it. There's, there's, there's a lot of external factors, maybe outside the direct control of, of telcos here. Um, what would you say are the main risks for DSPs, external risks in the, in the coming decade? What, what, be, what, what should we really be aware of out there? Any thoughts about external risks? Well, I think, I think innovation, and I'll say something bold here, I think, innovation always comes from outside. So you, you've got to create a platform or, a, or, or, or an initiative that other people can participate in. So with a, with a real vision and mission that people want to get behind. So those are sort of all sort of external factors. And when we look at sustainability, uh, an operator themselves isn't going to just be able to solve the problem. They're going to need to be the connectivity to what happens in their network, to what's happening at the edge, into the enterprise, into academia. Um, I think the, the, uh, the DSP will have a pivotal role to play in terms of driving and measuring sustainability overall. So I think from, from my perspective and what we're seeing, you know, our initiatives with, as I mentioned, with Microsoft and, and Google and, uh, and Amazon, with OS Climate, our other initiatives around the enterprise neurosystem when we're looking at how to get things from a farm to a store and how the logistics all is connected in terms of driving that with a mission of driving sustainability. Those are sort of open source type projects where we bring in the outside to look at that innovation and try and create areas where we can common, you know, focus on a common problem and a common cause. So from the open source guy, I think open source is going to be a, a very important part of what we do here. Excellent. Th thanks, Daryl. And Ahmed, you wanted to say something as well? Yes, I actually wanted to add another dimension. Is actually, uh, I think the, one of the biggest risks is our own fragmentation. So in this industry, in, in the past was DSP. If we got fragmented, this, this actually warrants that we will be separated. Even if we are in our journeys, at least in a, in a DSP type of uh, whatever the DSP definition is actually is, we have reached that. If we have reached it in a very different way, that is already a very big risk. You, we, we talked about the internal ones related to how we improve our processes internally, IT, automation, all that stuff. There is also something on the periphery when we try to expose our capabilities as APIs. On that, we need to be aligned, because if we, every operator have their own set of APIs, that's a destined to fail. We need to align, we need to have an alliance, like the Camara Alliance and other alliances, we're trying actually to put things together in a, in a coherent manner, so we, we aggregate our power in technology. And the other part is that once we move forward, we need to be able to consume our own services automatically, so I can use other operators' capabilities can use my capabilities. We can actually share assets. 
in an automated way. So if we actually are fragmented, even if we claim that we became digital service providers, but all on, on their own, then, then it's a problem because then we are not really achieving the objective at the end of the day. We don't have the scale. We cannot have the ecosystem. Then we are actually killing ourselves with the ecosystem stuff. Then we are not competing really with, with, the, with the key global players. We, we will never become global. So from my perspective, this type of fragmentation um, is, is one of the largest impediments. It's coming from us rather than from someone else. And we should not forget that this, this is fostered precisely by a totally old-fashioned regulation. Yes. And that's, uh, that's, uh, this fragmentation and all this, I mean, yeah. so it's something that is, is the curse. Of, it's the curse of a few of the few ones that were unlucky to be there when the monopolies were, were broken. Because, and, and still this is perception by the regulators that anyone that is selling a certain set of communication services is a monopoly or is willing to be. Well, no, there, there is a theory that any company would be a monopoly if it is allowed to, and which is something that probably is true, even the open source ones, I would say. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the problem is that I'm not against uh, a certain degree of regulation in the market of whatever the market, but for sure is totally... Uh, is, is uh, the, the way in which it is applied right now is totally unnatural. And thinking about, for example, this uh, uh, environmental sustainability mm -hmm. could be like, for example, if we were forced by regulation to be reducing our carbon, our carbon, fruit, carbon footprint by 30% per year, for example. If you are making the network grow and you have more devices connected and more systems connecting the devices, this is sheer impossible, impossible by definition. If you have a, a, a reasonable regulation, probably you would take into account the impact, the whole impact of this additional connectivity. This, this is a, a, for, just to illustrate the case that uh, under we are. The current regulation is precisely impacting and limiting the capacity of, uh, of, evol of evolution because it's, it's regulating the old market in which we have the, the good old copper telephone lines and that's all. So, so let me frame Guy. Just let me frame. I was going to just say, I also, I also fear what regulation we may be getting because I'm sure we're getting a lot more digital services based regulation, and the regulators sure. are dreaming this up as we speak. And I, and I hope it's going to be an improvement. But sometimes I think uh -uh, it may uh, not be. Uh, just a note. Ahmed was mentioning this idea of mm. the uh, of this change of services among among uh, providers. Oof. Go to the room. <laughs> Don't think about that. We'll, we'll, be... we'll, we'll go to Jeff, but um, we'll get the microphone over to a gentleman over the left somewhere who, who put his hand up for questions. So while we, while we hear from Jeff, we'll move the microphone around the room. Jeff. Well, well I, I wonder if there's a way to reframe your question. Because there's, I mean, what happens if, if this is almost like a 1961 moment for us? So let's reframe our question that says, let's just act. The good thing, the internet is completely broken, everybody. This globalization idea hasn't worked out so well. From a data privacy point of view, countries are confused, they're not sure what to do. Internet services are backing out very quickly. So the whole economic model of the internet over the last 15 to 20 years is gonna change in the next three to five, oh. right? And it's gonna change into hopefully not a localized solution, but a distributed solution where there are points of presence and control. Now, I think our industry, the reason I say 1961, apparently if you were alive in 1961, the world was horrible. I wasn't either, I, I it might look like I was. The, uh, uh, but that was that JFK moment where they said, an, you know, he set this audacious goal that says, we need to actually build a world that it's safe to participate online and in a democratically fair and sociable way for those countries that want to take part. Uh, that's something that the youth of today, from every single perspective, coming back from sustainability and climate, they want to engage in building a different world. That's why I go back to that bold statement, bold mission. I would argue our industry is the industry that could have the biggest effect on how we change how the planet works and we could collectively collaborate on that. And I think we could draw talent in by doing that. And I think we could be quite surprised by what we can mend because of the DNA of our industry rather than the lack of it. Now that requires though, I'm not discounting at all any of these challenges, but it is that mindset and mind framing that says, 
In actual fact, I don't think this world is that bad because the world that we've got to so far is, is accepted as not working very well. Wouldn't that be a goal to, to strive for? Um, thanks, Jeff. That's an interesting point, that. Um, but we're going to our audience somewhere by the uh, left-hand side there. Just about to see you. Yeah, Please. good afternoon. Firstly, thank you all for a tremendous um, last couple of days. It's been outstanding. Uh, I just want to build a couple of points. The Deutsche Telekom gentleman who said the industry is fragmented, IMEX, so we invest in tech companies, 20 million, help them grow and exit. We also have a boutique advisory firm, but I'm ex voter, so I was on the UK board, Spanish board. The industry is at the heart of society. Yeah? It is absolutely the heart of society. I would urge us to go away from a connectivity play, yeah? because there's so much value to be provided. If you look at the two point or three points of sustainability, the E, S, and G, if you pick the S, look at the growth that's taken place in so many economies through mobile. Yeah? Just incredible. You know, Kenya, M-Pesa, India, just the whole economy is run through the mobile. So let's be proud of the innovation that we've been bringing versus allowing the, the hyperscalers who are going to eat your lunch. You know, if we think TikTok and all of those great companies which are fantastic are your competitors, they're not. It's the hyperscalers. Yeah? They're going to commoditize your infrastructure and... and the, the only other point I would say is on leading the way to change the planet, to make the planet a better place, which is about attracting talent. Yesterday, the Bank of England announced that in the next 10 years, they were most likely going to find banks 330 billion pounds because of stress testing to do with climate change. Yeah? We do a huge amount of work in financial services because our companies are fintechs. Every board in the financial services companies are saying the ideal partner I need to work for is a telco. And when I look at them, why would a bank want to work or an asset manager want to work with a telco? It's because this industry, if you collaborate, provide the data for transparency to see are we creating a better world? And if we're not, those bad actors can really, really be exposed because it's going to be a name and shame or we won't have time. So listen, thank you very much. I would urge this industry to really collaborate because if you're not as an ex-industry person, it's going to be a pretty glum area. But the opportunities are tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Collaborate and change the world and use the data that, that, that these devices which you operate provide. And thank you very much. Well, thanks. Yeah. For thanks for your comments. Thanks very much for your comments. Very, very positive yeah, comments. Um, Ahmed, please. Just uh, thanks really for, for your comments. I'm really much appreciated. I mean, adding to that, we, we generated value of four, four and a half trillion dollars just last year. So I, I fully agree with you. And it's 5% of the GDP, global GDP. The, the point I was making on fragmentation is a fear of the future, is that if we do it separately without collaboration, exactly that what could happen. So we could actually lose value. But thanks also for the point of collaboration, and the point I actually maybe didn't mention, and I think it's, it's good to, to stress it out, um, we need to, the, the, the whole topic of exposure being open is to allow for everybody to participate. There, there is room for suppliers, for system integrators, for operators. There's a loom, room for everybody to participate into that, and that's the idea, is that the, the operators are not going to do everything on their own. They just open up to be able to actually have the platform so others to build on. So I'm, I'm, I'm fully in agreement, so I fully agree with you with what you said, so in line. So. Any more comments? Uh, oh, do you, 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 is this, did you spot someone in the audience? Once no, no, it's exactly. You, you, I thought you were asking for oh, no, 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 comments no. in the no. Right, thanks. Uh, well, look, we should, uh, we should move on um, because we want to get through a few more talking points here. Um, all, all this effort, the risks and uncertainties, is it ultimately worth the trouble? I've just seen your hand go in the air, but I'll come to you after this one. Uh, uh, is it worth the trouble? Are the new commercial opportunities actually great enough to warrant this evolution from CSP to DSP? I think we've answered that in the affirmative, hopefully, so far. But, you know, do, do, I'd like to ask, you know, do telcos even have a choice here? Uh, because we're positioning it as a choice in a way, but perhaps they, they don't have a choice. And... Going back to Yogesh at, at Telly 2, we, we just put that one to him as well. Let's, uh, let's see what uh, Yogesh's very uh, affirmative answer to this point is. Yeah, I think you nailed it by yourself by saying, I don't think they have a choice. 
I don't think we have a choice. I don't think anyone has a choice. Digital is the future. How do we get there? Do we remain connectivity, essential utility? Do we grow up to the next level and participate in that ecosystem which everyone is talking about today, which our generation is living today? And actually our parents are also subscribing to the same thing. Everything should happen without calling. That is digital in a nutshell. So, yeah, very bold. Um, digital services, everything except, you know, picking up the phone and making a voice call, I, I, I guess. But he also touched on, you know, the generational aspect, the, the, the new generation that's, that's emerging is coming into, into society and into uh, in becoming our customers. They're the ones who really seem to want more of a change than perhaps our generation did. It seems very encouraging that. And, uh, you know, perhaps you don't have a choice now. We have to, we have to go with, with them. And they're, they're the ones who are going to be um, making the changes. Yeah, I think, you know, it, you've got to innovate. Yeah, with another bowl. If you don't innovate, you will die mm. if you're a telco. That's, that's my personal opinion. And you've got to innovate at a faster and faster pace. The only way you're going to do that is along with the way you were saying is, you know, innovate by exposing APIs, building common understanding and standards. And then, you know, have that innovation fed from the outside in because they're going to keep you honest. They're going to keep you sharp. They're going to keep you uh, with disrupting your own business and, and where you need to go. And I think the younger generations that will come into our businesses that we will nurture will want to move at that pace. Um, and I think that we might underestimate that in some instances. Mm. I, I would say that there is a, since I, uh, I started working in the sector that is Despite of my white hair, it was 10 years ago, so that's, uh, <laughs> I was working before in networking and all the like, but not in telco. I have had once and again the fear of commoditization. Becoming a commodity is bad. I mean, come on, come on. Co co becoming a basic enabler of economy and society is extremely good. It's cool. The point is what is important is precisely that we have to innovate in the aspects that would allow us to provide those essential services better to more people and to uh, all over the planet and beyond, if we start thinking about it. That, that, and that there is a lot of innovation to be done there. And there's nothing bad in, in providing a basic service. That for sure, we can think about better ways of providing this basic service. And, this morning we were talking about precisely connectivity, yes, but can be secure connectivity, can be re reliable connectivity, can be extremely dense connectivity. We can evolve in that direction. We have to evolve in that direction because otherwise, well, society in general would not uh, uh, pardon us for this and we'll find someone else that would uh, be in the position of providing the services. Um, well, this is, I mean, if you think about it, I, I find it extremely cool and interesting. Thanks, Diego. Well, let's just uh, move back to our audience because I think uh, Ian at the front there. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you were talking about external factors. Sorry, just to jump back to that. But I think it's an important one is that as we move to a software world driven by software, differentiation will come from software. Of course, there'll be some hardware differentiation. But I think software is key for that. And we see, for example, let's say operators, the people in this room are mainly providing connectivity. Let's call it that. But look at the stock exchange, Vonage. These are people able to scale internationally. And that's a problem we certainly have in Europe, that it's very, very fragmented. We have each country has three to four operators, mobile operators, yellow and fixed line operators. And so it's so fragmented, software needs scale to be effective. And in fact, that's why the hyperscalers are successful, because they can scale internationally, let's say under the hood, if you like. Uh, and Vonages and other companies, or even Microsoft, if you like, with Teams, can just sit on top because they can scale and provide a service. And I just think we collaboration, we talk about standards. It's not just standards. I, mean, I can give you a, a real example here of, um, I won't, don't want to mention the manufacturer, but four, four operators in one country uh, have one device. I'm talking about one mobile phone. And the, each of the device manufacturers has a team configuring that phone for each of those operators. And the same service, they configured four different ways. 
the amount of, let's say, inefficiency that we have in the industry is quite amazing in lots of ways, when those sort of things could be, I think, a lot more standardized. So software is key, and, and we, we still have so a long way to go on efficiency. Thank you. I, I fully agree, and this is something that the, uh, this uh, lack of, of consolidation in the market, in most cases, is caused by national regulation. It's, it's as it is. I mean, every government wants to have their own, uh, their own environment for setting the rules and for, well, uh, among other things, and this morning I was talking about the, uh, the airlines. To some extent, it happens as a little bit as well in many countries. I, mean, I would not say in, in all countries, but in many countries it happens as well as it's a, it's a, you need your uh, flagship operator, which is our national one that is here in, and it's ours. And well, that's something, I mean, that's something in which, in that respect, and in respect with the um, uh, spectrum um, um, auctions and all the like, we are, our hands are cuffed. We, we, we have to live with that. Uh, and it's true. It is causing inefficiencies. Some time ago, I was in a conference in which people were talking about that in, in 10 years, the uh, processing capacity and the storage capacity has multiplied by, I don't remember the factor, and networking capacity has only multiplied by one third of that. And I asked the, the guy who was making this, uh, this statement, well, you know, computing or storage are regulated? So you, you tell me. Jeff? So, so I, I think it, there's a, an interesting point I want to come back to with your question that's really good. I, every single successful digital business always understands what product it's selling to its customer and it understands and maximizes the fit, the value, and the migration. I don't think as an industry we spend enough time understanding the product that we're selling to our customers and how we could maximize the value of those products today and then potentially create new products. I, the example, I'm, I'm a T-Mobile customer, and I was listening very hard. This was triggered by Chris's question yesterday. Uh, what is the product that I have actually bought from T-Mobile? It's actually a financing product for an iPhone. That's really what I bought. That's how they captured me. Uh, the second product I bought was where my daughter wanted a phone. And we went to AT&T, and it was next door to T-Mobile. And it was just by chance, I thought, huh, maybe they have a family plan. And we went into T-Mobile. and. Lo and behold, we, we get you know, our connectivity for 40% cheaper. That, that wasn't pushed me. They knew all of this about me, but they couldn't unlock it. The last one that is quite innovative from T-Mobile is when I landed at Heathrow, turned my phone on. They asked me if I wanted to spend $50 to get 15 gig while I was here for a week and make calls. And I just hit yes. Now, in that process, it was horrible. I, I could have disconnected it so many times. So they've got breakage in that journey. Every good DSP will make sure you don't have any breakage. It's one button, it's yes, and you're signed up. I spend about $200 with T-Mobile a, a month, just for mobile, right? They don't treat me any differently from someone that spends $30 a month. That just blows my brain away. In India, there's more millionaires in India than there are in the UK. Are they treated any differently by, by telecom or not? I know they didn't used to be when I was in Ericsson. I don't know if they've, they've changed that. What we've done differently, the, the, real, the reason that you have to change how the networks work is to really surface that data up, to actually have an ability to have an intelligent conversation in a modern world with your customers in real time. The core business for Rakuten actually is rewards, loyalty, and points. That's really at the nucleus of everything else. Everything else is just the digitalization of those different businesses. That's also something we can share and we can and discuss because uh, it's so valuable. It's, it's the only product. I don't wake up in the morning hoping that telecom's done something for me, but it's the first product I ever use. And it's the product that I need continuously throughout the day. So I. Having that demand is a huge opportunity. It's a lot better than you know, selling cigarettes, very honestly. So from a marketing point of view, and I'm just now going to hit and get brutal on marketing in telecom, I think marketing has done a disservice 
because somehow it's become a chant about G's that are completely irrelevant. The customer of the G's are the us in the room ourselves to be able to do something else. So I pray that 6G, we accept that the customer is our industry and we build something that helps us automate scale and become very efficient around that. And the marketing people actually start to stand in the shoes of the customers. And to, this is where I think Neil kind of in between some of his other comments is, is spot on. It's like, it, it's like customers and growth, but we, it's not that hard. That, that's, that's, it's a mindset thing again, I think. It comes back to mindset. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I think I did see another hand at the back of the room. I do see another hand. Is that Francis? I'd just like to come back to the um, comment made by Jeff right at the beginning about um, sort of slightly schizophrenic view of the world. And uh, there's, there's a couple of words that have been used quite often, which is greenfield and brownfield. And um, what I'm hearing is a kind of, a, that's greenfield almost as a pejorative term. It's, it's, it's something we can't learn, learn from. And at the same time, I'm hearing as brownfield, like it's either too difficult for us to change or it's an excuse for change, or in fact, we don't have a need to change. And I just wonder whether the, 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 the panel has a view as to, uh, really, are, are, we, are we using this, um, these terms as a, uh, a means of sort of stopping us changing something rather than um, taking the opportunity? Oh, good question. Any, any, any thoughts from our panelists there? Are I can we? give a start. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, good point, of course. It could be, of course, used as an excuse, definitely, could be. But, uh, but reality is that um, the, the green field have uh, sometimes power of choice, much better power of choice. So they, they're starting really from a clean slate. So they can think in the best possible approach. And you can see that in, in many technologies. If you didn't start with, with something, you can start with the one that is better off. So followers sometimes, followers in some, in some industries of some things get it, get it better than the ones that have pioneered it in the first place because they took maybe a route. But that doesn't mean that we don't learn from Greenfield. We definitely need to learn from Greenfield and we need to challenge ourselves. We need to make sure that it's not an excuse and it's rather something that is really concrete, that we build the past with that. So there are examples, concrete examples, that we, for example, learned from what Rakuten have, have done and got inspired from that. It's a green field, but we're trying to take the same approach. So if you look at trend segregation and the paths, we're trying to take the same approach, but considering where we are, because we cannot ignore where we are. So we cannot give away the service. We cannot completely uh, forklift the network and do something else. We need to migrate it. And then migration would entail some requirements. So I'm, Definitely acknowledging that Greenfield would inspire us, but we should not use, definitely we should not use Brownfield as an excuse, but rather in a way, how do we reach this destination rather than just excusing us not to move, of course. Yeah. If I may add, I think we cannot, um, we don't have a choice, as Yogesh already said, and you can decide if you are part of innovation or not, but you cannot decide if innovation will happen because it will happen anyway, with you or without you. And um, I would like also to encourage um, 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 operators and other partners of the value chain to think twice when, when they say that actually this is an area where we want to compete and we don't want to collaborate because I personally believe that there is a lot of room for collaboration. Um, and sometimes we are too, narrow thinking because we, we don't take the outside approach. We need to think about, is this really something where we can differentiate alone in, in the competition? Is this really something where um, um, an end user would choose us? Or is this rather something that we, we can learn from each other and combine forces and um, do best practice sharing? Um, All right, thanks, Anita. Any other comments? Well, just the comment that every new business model and idea is a greenfield opportunity. Mm -hmm wherever you are. And the only reason not to execute it on it is potentially you don't have the right support from a business point of view, a commercial point of view, or a structure point of view. That's right. And those are the three real challenges. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's potentially, uh, the fear I have at the moment is the industry will try and do new things, but do it the old way. Yeah. And you will get then a similar result to the, the old way. The, because commercials is a mindset. Price, price is just an agreement, and price is fixed based on the engagement model as well. 
You know, still, unfortunately, that is still a possibility. We hope it doesn't happen, but it's, you know, it's still a possibility. Um, unless there's any more comments, uh, I'd like to move on to our last talking point, last talking point of this year's event. So for those telcos who are committed, who do believe in a, in a sustainable DSP future, how, how do they get there? Are there certain milestones? Are there, are there certain points they've got to hit? And are we talking about... Uh, you know, is it a progressive evolution or is it something that maybe could be undertaken in stages? You know, is it a sprint for survival? Um, let's first of all go and just hear what uh, Yogesh from Tele2 had to say about this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a marathon. Marathon with multiple sprints on the way. And that makes it so tedious and so actually inspiring at the same time. So it's like you're running a marathon, but there are sprints on the way. The first sprint is the architectural sprint without a data architecture and without linking the data all the way to the latency of the flow to online, we will not be able to discover that. That's number one sprint. Second sprint is the way we organize. Is it hierarchical? Is it together? Do we focus together? on certain features which are going to make difference on the payment, on the logging cap capacities, on the cyber securities, how do we do that? And then the third sprint, which is ultimate sprint, is a scale up. How do we scale up so that it's not only 40% digital, it's not only 50, it is 100%. And it will not take five years, we need to get ready faster. A marathon with sprints horrifies me, but um, I see what he says here. There's, there's three distinct areas. Um, any, 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 any thoughts on that or, or, or generally any thoughts on, on the milestones that maybe we have to hit in this journey? Diego? I believe there is a, there is a milestone that is important as well that is precisely this, whatever is rela related with this disaggregation moving which we are, we are involving, which what you have is separate uh, capacity, the, uh, the infrastructure itself from, from uh, functionality, what runs on top of it and that allows you to be flexible and think in terms of the uh, precisely of, uh, of, uh, of an architecture that can grow and adapt to the, uh, to the, further, to the further needs. Take into account one thing, when talking about separating capacity and functionality, I'm not saying because I remember in the good old days at the beginning of NFV, everybody was thinking about uh, a totally homogeneous uh, uh, network infrastructure, we have realized that there are certain functions that require <coughs> specialized uh, uh, capacities, uh, physical capacities, etc. But precisely the homogeneity in managing, in dealing with the workloads, in identifying which are, which, how the functionality can be moved, etc., this is, this is essential and it's the, uh, I would say, it's the necessary first step. For sure, you cannot do it, switch it off and switch it, uh, the, the new thing on, and we, you had to be wise to make this gradually because you have no other choice. We live in a ground field, in a ground field environment, and, and I don't think in that case is, a, is any kind of, a, of, a, of a excuse. This isn't going to happen overnight. We know that. It's going to take time, but we don't want it to take too long, obviously. Um, so any thoughts about any... any key steps, initial steps that we need to take to get there, or, or how we measure it. As Anita said earlier, you know, the, this whole measurement aspect is, is very important, how we benchmark mm, sure. and, and, and how we follow. Any, any thoughts about uh, maybe what we need to hit? Well, in our eng engagements, uh, uh, an at and is a good example of this that uh, we're working uh, in partnership with. I mean, at the end of the day, our core business, because we're really talking about becoming fit and efficient in what we do, uh, you plan, you build, and you operate networks. And they're all business processes. They tend to be traditionally very, very people intensive and manual. So which one of those processes would you like to change first? How and where, which in, in what scope, and what kind of outcomes do you want to get? With, with AT&T, we're working together to understand how to uh, transform, how to plan networks, not only wireless, but wireline. Uh, so it's the operational model of that and how to start rather than planning directly to the network, you plan through a software platform to a network. You decouple and that's how you start to get the scale of the operation. 
because uh, we do have a, another challenge we're coping with in telecom. Most of the people running our telecom networks are also like us approaching an age where we maybe want to do something else. So it's not a case of kind of destroying jobs. It's the fact that no young people are wanting to come in and do those one for one jobs. They do want to come in and sit in front of a software console and, you know, play God at the side of the size of the US. That's exciting. So understand what you, where you want to change, understand the business outcome, and then let's agree on how to do that. And that's where we can, we, we say to all the people we speak to, you have one of three choices. You don't change, which is fine, your choice. You do change and you start from scratch and you can do that and you will be successful. It'll take you a long time if you stick at it. Or you can inherit what we know how to change, which is, which is like not the end destination. It's like 50% done and it will always be 50% done. It will never end. So there are the three choices on where to start, but it's grounded in operational metrics. What is your, what's your employee to revenue? What's your employee to network scale? What's your, you know, let's start getting those in line with what a software company is, because then we can compete, you know, in the broader ecosystem as well. All right, good point, Jeff. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, any, any further points on, on, on milestones, Anita? What I miss a bit is um, the people factor there. Mm. So we talk about technology, but we need to consider uh, that actually we, we are in a change process. So it's extremely important to take the people with us and to also think about, and I know that th this is happening, um, how to mix teams because we need also the, the knowledge um, of, of how to operate a network and everyone who was ever responsible for operations um, doesn't want to have this moment where the network is down or any, any other to, uh, or subscribers cannot log into the network. I had this in my life very uh, early in my business career and um, um, it makes you be much more careful. And we need this part because we need to deliver, of course, and continuously deliver. And we need at the same time the new generation, which is questioning the status quo and how to mix those teams and how to get the best out of them to have a healthy balance. I think this is what we, uh, what we miss a bit in the conversation because we talk about more about technology than about the human factor there and not to lose the good know-how the um, 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 industry has already on board. As you say, technology is a tool, but it's the people who are actually going to be implementing and, and, and making the difference. Okay, well, look, um, we are almost out of time, so um, I think we should wrap up this session for now. But before we do, we do want to have a look at our final poll results so far. So if we can bring up, please, the results so far. Um, Goodness me, what will stop CSPs from becoming successful DSPs? Well, 67% of those who voted identified weak leadership and reluctance to change. We don't want to hear this, do we? Um, but, you know, the audience speaks. Uh, lack of clear DSP strategies and business models. There's, a, there's another, another high one. Anyway, we'll be following that one, and I know uh, Ray and his team will be, will be uh, picking up on that um, perhaps uh, later this week and next week. Okay, um, that, as they say, is, is that. Lunch will be served shortly. It's going to be outside in the lobby, so uh, please join us for that. Um, we are going to be hosting our finals of the pinball very soon, but before we do that, um, my beautiful assistant is going to be uh, coming up on stage with a piece of paper in an envelope, please, with a gold-edged gold envelope. Okay, here comes a gold-edged envelope. Thank you very much indeed. I shall open the gold-edged envelope, which is entitled Final Qualifiers for the Charity Pinball. Da, 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 da. In no particular order, <laughs> Anthony Streeter. Do I hear hey? Yes. Mark Fletcher. Sean Carr. <laughs> is this a fix? <laughs> Oh, and Neil McRae. <laughs> right, you four, congratulations. You're, gonna be, you, you're, you're in the playoff um, uh, as soon as this panel's finished, uh, at the back of the room there. Uh, and of course, we've got that beautiful trophy there that Neil will take home. I mean, so that the winner will take home. <laughs> uh, and I've just been informed that we have a collective total across, you know, across the 2019 and this year's DSP Leaders will form. Our charity total is currently standing at about 8,700 pounds, so that's absolutely terrific. That's a big increase. So thank you all very much for your generosity. 
Right, all of our sessions will be available to watch online. You expect as much, Telecom TV. Uh, the first videos are going up very, very soon, probably tomorrow. You can watch full-length interviews with all those guests who were unable to make it, who contributed their little clips. We've got longer versions of those, and I'm sure we will have even more video goodness for you. Just head to telecomtv.com. Our online summit, plug, 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 resumes next month. Uh, Open RAN is in June, and we've got AI and automation that follows that. Cloud Native Telco returns, yay! Uh, 5G evolution, and we've got a new one for this year, Open Telco Infra. So that's all happening later this year. Just register for free on the site. You can watch, you can vote, you can submit questions. A huge thank you to all of you here in the room for attending and participating. It has been great to see you all. Uh, to all our guests, the guests on stage and the guests who've been on stage in our previous sessions, thank you very much for sharing your considerable insights and to our online audience of course because they sent in a lot of questions we got through as many as we could um, so we do appreciate that also to our sponsors obviously we couldn't do this without you and we are most grateful for uh, your support as always we've got a great facilities team here at the Fairmont Hotel uh, they've been very helpful to all the crew to all of the Telecom TV team thank you all very much indeed and I apologize if I've forgotten to thank anyone else. I usually forget to thank somebody. Now, don't forget to come and see me and Ray later. Ray's over there. You can't hide. Tell us what you think. Tell us what things you'd like us to, to, to focus on next time, what you'd like us to develop. We genuinely want to hear from you because we do this for you. So we want to make it as best as we can. In fact, we want to make it absolutely perfect. And speaking of the next DSP Leaders event, we are going to leave you with a little teaser. But for now, thank you to all our guests for this final session. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome to the DSP Leaders World Forum 2022. All you in the audience, you're the people who are actually moving this industry along. You're the ones who believe in this evolution to DSP. You're the ones who recognize that we do need to make a change. We need to make a break from the past. Not because you just want to, but because we have to. And we've been covering this sector, the move towards DSP, digital services provider. We've been covering it for a number of years now. And we totally believe in it, and thankfully, a lot of the industry does too. Over time, the utility of networks has gone up, but it's a bit like the frog in the water. As the temperature goes up gradually, it doesn't feel it. No one notices. Mm -hmm. I think the, the pandemic reset that. How do we make sure that the applications are highly available and secure across multiple cloud environments to help our customers get to that end state where they, they need to be? You move something into the cloud, and it is a, a live beast that you have to manage. That cost is something you got to think about every day. That's something you don't think about today in your telco data centers, right? As an industry, we're just going through this whole open RAN initiative. For what purpose? To disaggregate all the vendors so we can make choices at each point. I'm confident that the vendors are, you know, slowly getting there so that all these applications in cities are going to be able to leverage uh, the, the, the wide variety of infrastructure that will exist. You've got to virtualize the edge of the network and support initiatives like ORAN, otherwise you won't have that platform at the edge. If I were an operator, I'd be looking at the evolution of the private 5G market to identify the use cases that represent potentially low-hanging fruit for slices in the public 5G domain. By the end of this decade, 30% of our network in Europe will be open run. Okay, Neil wins the prize for the first mention of 6G at the DSP Leaders World Forum. <laughs> I think you have to kind of get back to, you know, what's really important. Again, I mentioned the word customers and, and, and solving customers' problems because if you solve a customer's problem, they'll give you money forever. I think we should be calling this the ODSP, the on-demand service provider.